Well, hello, class. Um, it's a beautiful day out here, so I'm going to try to record out here as long as the uh, yellow jackets will leave me alone. So um, we have one more lecture that I, you know, recording that I wanted to make concerning the sequential sampling models. Uh, and that is, we want to see how these sequential sampling models are applied to what we call value-based decisions. And uh, I've done a lot of work on this kind of application myself with Jim Townsend. We have a theory that we call decision field theory. So I'm gonna review that, some of our work on decision field theory with you. So remember the idea is that, you know, there's an evidence-based decisions that we've been talking about. Um, it's kind of like, well, let's say you, you're looking at a uh, MRI and you're trying to decide if cancer's present. So you're, you're doing some kind of inference, you're collecting evidence across time to, to make an inference. But in value-based decisions, you know, let's say you're faced with two different consumer products, like you're trying to decide which motorcycle to buy. Well, in that case, you're not really accumulating evidence, you're accumulating evaluations. You know, you're looking at, well, how fast is the motorcycle? What's the style of the motorcycle? You know, and, and then what's the color and all those kind of features. And so you're accumulating these evaluations. So value-based decision-making is in a, an accumulation of evaluations and you have a preference a preference state that's evolving over time instead of an evidence state. And so this preference state evolves until the preference gets strong enough to make a decision. And when your preference for one option gets strong enough relative to the other option, you hit the threshold boundary and stop and make a decision. So that's, <clears throat> that's the kind of the basic idea of these models. So let me uh, share my screen and we'll see how this idea works more in more detail. Try this again, sorry. So I hope everybody sees me okay. Well, let's see. Um, yeah, I gave this, this is actually, this, this, this presentation I'm showing right now is actually based on a um, keynote talk that I gave to the uh, Foundation of Utility Risk and Uncertainty meeting several years ago, you can see 2014. But um, uh, yeah, so we're, we like to think of decision field theory as trying to forge, make a, you know, forging together cognitive science and decision science principles. Let me see if I get this to work here. And yeah, I've worked on this theory with a number of collaborators. Uh, most importantly, Jim Townsend. Joe Johnson was a graduate student here at IU. York Rees Camp, he's at Basel University now. He was a uh, postdoc of mine, Tim Pleskak. He was a postdoc here, and now he's a professor in Kansas. Jared Hotelling's a new professor at the University of Illinois. And Rachel, Rachel is a professor in Israel, and Robert Rose, an administrator now, and Adila Dieter, she's a full professor in Germany. So let's see if I can get this thing to work. It's like it's not, it's not obeying me. Okay, so what are the goals of decision field theory? Well. The, Traditional decision theory, like utility theory, um, we talked a little bit about utility theory when we derived signal detection theory. Uh, but utility theory is a static theory and deterministic theory. So, but human behavior is, first of all, it's not, it's not deterministic. People are unpredictable and change their minds. And secondly, people are not static. You know, decisions take time and, and our preferences evolve across time and um, we might change our mind across time. So we need a theory that's, uh, first of all, it's gotta be stochastic or probabilistic as opposed to deterministic to account for the probability of choice. Oh, the spelling error. And secondly, it's gotta be dynamic as opposed to static. So we try to build a theory that has those components. Of course, the uh, sequential sampling models have both those components. That's why we're attracted to them. And we, we like to think of um, we're building our, our theory on the basis of cognitive principles rather than rational principles. Like, like economic theory, uh, the, the utility theory is based on economic theory, economic and utility theory and economic theory is based upon rational axioms, which are sometimes not reasonable to assume for human beings. They're not always rational, but we're trying to build our theory based upon cognitive principles. And we try to position our theory kind of like in a Mars level, 
kind of like this algorithmic level between neuroscience, which is the implementation level, and behavior, you know. So we've had many applications of decision built theory, and I'm going to be going through some of them. I'll start out talking about our applications to decision making under risk and uncertainty. But then we'll talk about um, uh, applications to multi attribute and multi alternative decision making. This is kind of a topic that's important in consumer behavior and consumer research, like you know, buying a car, or choosing an apartment. And then I'm going to talk about uh, briefly, we'll talk about later on how we develop models for how people form prices. How do you form a price for? something like if you're going to sell your car how do you judge what the price should be and uh so yeah so we'll only probably get to this part here but we also have applications to confidence judgments and we also have applications to what are called decision weights those are the, the importance weights how much weight do you put on different attributes like um how much weight do you put on quality versus cost for example in a consumer project product consumer product mm. So we're going to talk about the uh, yeah, risk decision under risk and uncertainty and the multi alternative decision making and the relationship between choices and prices. So let's talk about applications of the risky decision making. So we've often down, been down this, this kind of road where we have to take a chance which, which, way, which way goes home and which way gets us lost. We can't rem might not remember. Maybe we took a walk this way and now, now we don't know which way goes back. I've been in that situation many times, I'm afraid. Well, here's how decision field theory works. No surprise, we've seen this figure many times, but now it's, what we're doing is changing the axis, the, the, the vertical axis. So once again, we have time on the horizontal axis. <clears throat> and on the vertical axis, we have a preference state. And let's say you're choosing between a, a, a risky alternative, let's say maybe a risky surgery, or you can get wealth fast, but you could, you could get damaged permanently versus a safe alternative, like, you know, maybe some kind of physical therapy it might take a long time, but, um, but it's a little bit safer. So you're trying to choose between these two, two courses of action. And the idea, again, is you start out with some initial state, like if, you, if it's a brand new choice, you've never thought about it before, you might be starting out neutral, unbiased between the two options. And then you start thinking about, you know, imagining the consequences of each action, and you get an evaluation. And so you, get, you might get an evaluation like favoring the risky alternative, but later on you might get evaluations favoring the safe alternative. And so you're accumulating these evaluations. So this trajectory, at any point in time on this trajectory, that represents your accumulated preference state, where you've accumulated all these thoughts, all these evaluations of the consequences. So you, can, you continue evaluating the consequences of each action. You know, you're comparing the, the consequences of each action and accumulating those evaluations. And so, but finally, maybe your, your evaluations start accumulating and your preference state starts getting stronger and you decide you almost hit the boundary here, but not quite. And then you hit the boundary here for choosing the risky alternative. So you go, decide to go ahead and do the risky surgery. And so just like we talked about before, this model predicts that the time it takes to make the decision, that's the decision time, the time it takes to hit the boundary. And it also, um, you know, like we talked about before, it predicts the probability that you make a choice. Well, the probability that you choose the risk of the sure thing is the probability that you hit the top boundary before you hit the bottom boundary. So we get both the choice and the decision time. And we can also measure confidence, but we're not going to talk about confidence this time. We talked about it last time. So that's a binary choice. Now we're going to apply this model to cho choosing between two gambles. <coughs> so let's... <coughs> Now, of course, like we talked about before, the threshold boundaries are really important for these kind of decisions. You know, so if you um, move the threshold boundaries in close, you make a quicker decision, but you often make, maybe make an error, you know? But if you have the boundaries out farther, your decisions are gonna take longer, but you might be making a, a, a better decision by thinking about it longer. So when the boundary's out, you're gonna accumulate more evaluations. You're gonna think about the consequences longer. Now, if it's a really, really important decision, you want to put the boundaries out, you know. But if, if it's kind of a trivial decision, then maybe you want to pull the boundaries in. Or maybe if you're a kind of an impulsive decision maker, you might have the boundaries close in. But if you're a more deliberative, thoughtful decision maker, you put the boundaries out. So that's the same as we saw before with the evidence-based decisions. And so that's how we account for speed accuracy trade-off effects. 
Now let's see how the theory is applied to um, a choice between a risky and a safe alternative. <clears throat> so we have each row is an action. So the first row is like taking your risky action and the safe alternative is, uh, well, the second row is taking the safe alternative. And these, these columns represent, represent different states of the world. So like if it's a medical decision, it might be different states um, of health or condition in your body. And you don't, you're not really sure which state you're in. Like maybe there's a bone that you don't know what the condition of the bone is, or maybe you don't know if your heart's gonna hold up to the surgery or whatever. So these are different possible states of the world. And so this, this matrix here is a um, payoff matrix. <clears throat> so each cell tells you the utility that you get for taking an action under a state of the world. So for example, <clears throat> if the first state of the world is present, you take the risk, you get the utility for taking the risk under the first state of the world. And if the first state of the world is present, but you choose the safe alternative, then you get the utility for choosing a safe alternative under the first state of the world, and so on. And like on the J, here's the J state of the world. If you choose the risk, you get the utility for that state of the world, choosing the risk. And under that state of the world, if you choose a safe alternative, you get the utility for the safe alternative for that. So that's just a decision problem. And that's what we call a decision under uncertainty. You might not, we call it uncertainty when we don't really know the probabilities of these states of the world. You might have, you might think some states are more likely than other, but you might not have an exact probability. And sometimes these probabilities have to be learned through experience. So that's when we call it decisions under uncertainty. And we call it decision under risk if we know the probabilities. But most decisions are decisions under uncertainty where you have states of the world and you might have some beliefs about these states of the world, but you know, they're, they're kind of subjective because everybody might have a different opinion about those, those beliefs. So it's decision making under uncertainty involves your subjective beliefs about these states of the world. That's the decision problem that we're trying to figure out. So we're gonna apply decision field theory to this decision problem. <clears throat> so here's how the theory works, kind of step by step. So at each moment in time, you predict like which, you make a prediction about what state of the world might be happening. So you're, you kind of focus your attention on one of the states of the world. So let's say you focus on the J state of the world. You're thinking about, you know, maybe your heart can't handle the surgery. You know, my age, you know, I have to worry about things like that. Actually, yeah, anyway. So maybe you're worried about this state of the world. You're thinking about that. Now, under that state of the world, you're gonna retrieve these two payoffs. Like, well, this is the payoff if you choose the risk under that state of the world, and this is the payoff you get it if you choose a sure thing under that state of the world. And so then you compare the two payoffs, and you get a, va we call it a valence. You know, that's the difference between the two payoffs. So if it's positive, that means you're favoring the risk. If it's negative, that means you're favoring a sure thing. And then you accumulate those, those valences, so this is, we're using like what we call the ornstein ullenbeck process. But, and, but basically it's a kind of linear system. But your new state of the world is, you know, a weight times the previous state of the world plus the input valence. So this weighting factor can uh, produce primacy or recency effects. For example, if, if gamma is a number between, positive number less than one, we get kind of recency weighting of the, of the past outcomes that you, of the past evaluations. So it produces a, um, an accumulation, but doesn't accumulate the valence equally. And so if you have recency effects, the more recent evaluations have more impact than the earlier evaluations. Anyway, so then you keep accumulating this preference state. Like it's, it's a relative preference state. It's the preference state relative for risk relative to the sure thing. You know, positive values indicate a preference growing for the risk, and negative values indicate a growing preference for the sure thing. So you can continue accumulating this preference state until you cross a boundary, like we talked about before. And so we have some threshold boundary for choosing the risk. If the preference exceeds the top boundary, you choose the risk. If it falls below the bottom boundary, you choose a safe alternative. And as long as you're staying in between the boundaries, you continue thinking about things. You continue accumulating evaluations. Now, what, let's make some connections with traditional decision theory. Um, maybe uh, you, some of you have studied decision theory, uh, but maybe not. But, but in, decision field, in, in, in decision theory, not decision, but our theory is called decision field theory. Maybe I'll tell you why in a minute. But in decision theory, traditional economic theory, you know, these, you have a weight in, an, in a risky decision or a decision under certainty, that weight is your probability that a state's gonna occur. So that relates, 
the, the decision weight in, in traditional decision theory corresponds to our probability that you're going to attend to some outcome. So instead of thinking of having a fixed weight, like a static weight, we're imagining that you're attending the different out, attending the different states of the world moment by moment. And the probability that you attend to some state of the world at each moment is kind of analogous to what they call the decision weight in traditional decision theory. Also, we have an outcome. So like when you, when you pay your attention, when you've got your attention focused on some state of the world, you know, you retrieve these utilities for different actions. And so those are like the utilities that go into a traditional utility model. But what, you, what decision field theory contributes that the economic theory doesn't have is economic theory is a deterministic theory. So decision field theory is a probabilistic theory. So we can calculate the probability that you choose an option. And we can also, and it's a dynamic theory, so we can, compute, you know, we can determine and predict the uh, time it takes to choose an action. And we can also predict it quite confidence and prices, but and we're focusing right now on, on choice and response time. Kill off. I had to kill a yellow jacket. I'm getting nasty out here. Okay. Now, from this process that I just outlined, let's see if I can get this working right. I'm going to just run here. You know, from this from the sequential sampling process. So this is the cognitive process, this page. But you know, if we assume this cognitive process, we can derive some mathematical formulas that we use for making predictions. And so, so here's our valence. That's the utility difference that we get in it on each moment in time during your sampling to make a decision. So when you focus on state of the world J, you pick up this valence. So what, so we can think about, well, what's the expected value? What's the average value of this valence? Like, you know, if we did a time average of all your valences, what would the time average be? That's this, that's this, that's this difference in these two means. So this is the mean utility for the risk, and that's the mean utility for the sure thing. It's these means, that's what the traditional decision, this traditional decision theory works just with these means. Well, in our theory, these means represent the probability that you think about this state of the world times the valence that you retrieve from the payoffs when the state of the world exists. So that's our, our mean valence. We can, we can derive this mathematically. <clears throat> now your, your preference state basically is like a sequential sampling estimate of this mean. So this traditional decision theory just assumes somehow you can compute this mean difference. But in, in our decision field theory, we assume that you're going through some kind of sampling process like you know, estimating the, estimating the mean, sequentially sampling and estimating the mean. Now this valence is gonna have a variance too because you know, your, your attention is shifting to different possible states of the world across time. So you're thinking about one state of the world that might favor the risk, but then you might think of another state of the world that might favor the sure thing. And so this valence is you know, jumping around across time. And so there's some variability in the valence. And so we can derive the variance from our theory for this valence. And that's going to be the probability that you attend to some state of the world times the deviation between the valence, a value of the valence and the mean. That's squared, that's squared deviation, that gives us the variance. So we can theoretically compute something called like a D prime, like you have in signal detection theory, or like the D drift rate parameter in a diffusion model. That's the mean difference divided by the standard deviation of the, of the valence. Now traditional decision theory would just work with this numerator. But our theory, since it's a uh, sequential sampling model, we need to deal with the denominator too. So this denominator plays an important role in decision field theory that's not present in traditional decision theory. So in fact, this denominator kind of reflects um, how, how easier, how difficult or easy it is to discriminate these two different means. So like if you think about, you know, your, your actual preference state, which is your real cognitive variable, is sequentially sampling and you're getting a noisy estimate and you're trying to discriminate which, which actions is better. And so th this, this variability is gonna interfere with your discriminability. And so the difference between the mean is kind of scaled by this discriminability. So like you might have a difference between the mean, let's say of equal to 10. And if the discriminability is just one, like small, like one, you'd have a large ratio, 10 divided by one is 10. 
But if you had a, a, a mean difference, that's 10, the same mean difference in a traditional utility theory, but the standard deviation is 100, then this would be 10 divided by 100, 0.1. And so the discriminability would be very low. So even though you have the same mean difference, that same mean difference is going to get scaled by the um, standard deviation. And so when the when this when this D parameter, our discriminability parameter is large, then you're going to get choice probabilities that are pretty high, close to one, or you know, for the if if the mean difference is positive. But if this discriminability parameter is low, then the choice probability is going to be near 0.5 because you can't discriminate. So that's a key parameter in the model, this D parameter. It's like the well, it's basically going to be our mean drift rate parameter in a sequential sampling kind of diffusion model. Now we have other parameters too. We got the initial starting position. So remember that in this figure, we have a starting position right here. And so that's a parameter in the model. Now, if it's a brand new decision you never made before, we assume it's probably neutral near, near the middle between the two boundaries. But often you're making decisions that you have a lot of experience, past experience. And so that past experience is going to bias your initial starting position. Or you know, there might be some kind of status quo option. That status quo is going to bias your initial decision. So the bias might come from past experience or status quo. Now we also have a threshold parameter, like we talked about before. That's used to adjust your speed accuracy trade-offs. And we also have this gamma parameter. We call it the approach avoidance parameter. I won't be able to go into that whole lot of detail, but our papers talk about it. And anyway, that, that determines this primacy recency effect. That's this parameter right here. Now, if I set gamma equal to zero, then I just get a standard random walk sequential sampling kind of Wiener process. But if gamma is like not equal to zero, then I get this uh, ornstein uhlenbeck process. So we have this gamma parameter. And that later on, that'll become ki kind of important. See how that comes about later on. <clears throat> So and now, so we can derive, well, what's the probability to hit the top boundary before the bottom boundary? And of course, this is the, we go through the same methods in stochastic processing theory to derive you know, this equation right here. And so this is the probability that you choose the right when you have a choice between, that, or this is the probability you choose the risky alternative when you have a choice between the risky alternative and the safe alternative. And so, th so this is an exponential function. So this, is, this looks like the same choice probability function that you saw with Roger Ratcliffe's diffusion model. But, but we're now we're using our own parameters from decision field theory. So this mean drift rate D is determined by like this rate, this discriminability parameter, the mean difference in the utilities divided by the standard deviation of the valences. And then we have our threshold boundary parameter, like just like regular diffusion models, like Ratcliffe's diffusion model. And we have a starting parameter like Rackler's diffusion model. And then we can derive a formula for the mean, mean decision time, mathematically derive this formula. And um, we can, so now that we can predict choice probabilities and mean decision times, we can, kind of, we can do cross-validation tests because we can, we can fit the parameters, let's say, using the choice probability data, and then use those same parameters to pick, predict the decision time to make a decision. So that gives us a cross-validation test. Okay, so here's an example experiment. Okay. So we had subjects make a decision between a risky, a risky action, R, and a sure thing, S. So this safe one is really safe, it's a sure thing. <laughs> so the risky action was a, was a gamble. Well, it was, a, you know, was a, a set of payoffs that were normally distributed. So this risky act action had a normal distribution of payoffs. So if you chose the risk, you know, you, you get something that was normally distributed. But the mean was zero, so it had a zero mean, and, but it had a standard deviation. So the risky alternative has zero mean and a standard deviation. But we had two kinds of, two kinds of trials. On half the trials, uh, the risky alternative was a low risk. So the standard deviation was small, like 0.05 cents. So you, like, you know, two, two times the standard deviation is like the range. So you can win, you can win or lose 10 cents with the low risk. But in the other half of the trials, you had a high risk. And so on each trial, on the high risk, the standard deviation is 50 cents. Like two, two standard deviations is a dollar. So you can win or lose a dollar on each, or something ranging between a dollar on each trial. So that's the low and the high risk. Now we manipulated this factor 
So you see, we're manipulating the standard deviation here. And what we're, the reason we're manipulating that is because we want to manipulate them. Um, we want to manipulate this denominator right here. So we're trying to manipulate the, the, the standard deviation of the valences. You know, so if, with the high risk situation with the large variance, we're going to have a high standard deviation in the, in the valences. But with the low risk situation, we'll have a low standard deviation in the valences. So we can manipulate the denominator with that factor. Now we also change the sure thing. So we can change the sure thing from a plus three cents to zero to minus three cents. So, you know, you could take, you could take like this, like you could take a chance of winning or losing a dollar, or for example, you might lose three cents for sure. So you can say, well, do I want to lose three cents for sure in a trial? Or do I want a chance of winning or losing a dollar? Or you might have like, or maybe you can win three cents for sure. Or you can win, lose three cents for sure or win three cents for sure, or sometimes nothing. Now, so this factor S is changing the mean because the mean of the, the, mean of the risk is zero, but the mean of the sure thing is going from positive to negative. So th this sure thing is, is designed to, um, So that, that sure thing is changing this numerator, the mean difference. So, this, so this, the mean of the risk is zero, but the sure thing is going from, if it's positive, this difference would be, the numerator would be a negative difference for the risk. And if, if the sure thing is negative, this would be a positive difference for the risk. So we're changing the numerator by changing the sure thing. And now we also change the deadline time pressure. So they had to make this decision between the risky and safe alternative under three different time pressure conditions. One second, which is kind of a fast decision, or two seconds or three seconds. Three seconds is plenty of time. So that's going to be changing our threshold boundary right here. So we had like uh, 10 people do this experiment for, for many, many trials. So we had like um, a lot of data. Um, 1,560 trials from 10 participants. And so we recorded the choice and the decision time on each trial. And so here's the um, results that we got. Now we're getting this crossover interaction. Like the dots, like the blue dots, blue dots are the actual choice probabilities uh, under the high risk condition. And the red dots are the actual choice probabilities under the low risk condition. Now on, on the vertical, on the horizontal axis, we have the sure thing value. So, so this axis is manipulating the mean difference in the numerator here. So the, so the horizontal axis is looking at the change in the mean difference right here, because we're changing the sure thing. So we're changing the sure thing that changes the mean difference. But the, um, the red and blue are changing the variance. So the red and blue are, are changing this denominator, the standard deviation right here. And so what you can see is that when there's a high risk situation, the variance is high, the effect of the mean, the mean the change in the mean difference is small. It's, it's going down because when the sure thing's negative, you know, you like to take the risk because the mean of the risk is zero and this is negative. But when the sure thing's positive, you want to take the sure thing. So that's why it's going down. But it's going down more steeply under the low risk condition. It's going down more slowly under the high risk condition. And why is that? That's because of that standard deviation. Because you see the standard deviation is changing the slope. You know, here's the numerator, that's on the horizontal axis. So we're varying the mean difference. But the, the discriminability is also moderated by the standard deviation. So when we change this numerator and the standard deviation is small, we get a big change from the numerator. But if we change this numerator and the standard deviation is large, the denominator is large, we get a, a smaller change. Or if the standard deviation is really large, we get a flat line. So that's what's happening. We're flattening out the line here. As we increase the variance of the, of the uh, risk, makes it more uncertain and harder to discriminate from the sure thing. Uh, we get less discriminability and the, and the choices go, go nearer to 0.5. Whereas if, if low discriminability, we get a um, much steeper curve here. So we get the crossover, that's a crossover interaction. And what happens is, is this crossover interaction is changing across the time pressure. 
it's not a big change, but you can see that it's getting more extreme for the um, it's getting more extreme for the um, low risk conditions. They're going you know going down, like when you should be taking the um, sure thing, it's getting lower, and when you should be taking the the risk, it's getting higher. So that's the effect of the time pressure. So we got all three factors going on here. Now, this is a pro this the, this results this crossover turns out to be a big problem for many, many theories. Like, let's say you want, like, may, maybe you heard of the theory called prospect theory. Some of this math we don't need, let's say, but I'll just summarize it. Let's say a prospect theory. Theor prospect theory is determined, kind of a deterministic utility theory. Well, we, we can't predict the choice probabilities at all without de with a deterministic utility theory. So we might take prospect theory and put it into just a logistic function. You know, just stick it into like a logistic function like we've been using in some of our previous homeworks. So that makes the um, prospect theory a probabilistic prospect theory by using a logistic function. Well, if we do that, we have what's called a um, simple scale building model. Because that kind of a model says, well, the probability that you choose the risk over the sure thing will be an increasing function of the utility for the risk and a decreasing function of the utility for the sure thing. And this kind of model, no matter what the function is, like you might pick logistic function or you might pick a cumulative normal distribution function. But no matter what function you pick, it's a parameter-free prediction. This is one of these parameter-free qualitative predictions. This model cannot produce the, the crossover interaction effect. Because like if, um, if you prefer the um, low risk over the high risk when the sure thing's negative, then you should be preferring the low risk over the high risk when the sure thing is positive. So, you know, you can't get a reversal. I mean, like in other words, if we're finding that um, you prefer the low risk over the high risk when the sure thing's negative, that means the low risk has got greater utility than the high risk. But if we find that you prefer the high risk over the low risk when the sure thing's positive, that means that um, that the utility of the high risk is greater than the low risk. Well, we get a, we've got a contradiction here. So this model can't explain these results. There's no way to, so like a, a cumulative prospect theory or prospect theory that's put into logistic function, it, it's ruled out qualitatively, no matter what the parameters are, I can't predict this result. In fact, it would give you a um, strange interpretation because um, it would kind of give you, like this is why cognitive theories might be important for economics because you can, you would get some kind of mixed up interpretation of utilities. Because like when you, when you have, when the sure thing is negative, like when you're in the lost domain, when you're lost domain, then you're, you're kind of like risk averse because the risk has got lower, risk is chosen lower here than it is here. You're risk averse. But when you're in the gain domain, now you become risk seeking. So if you had a prospect theory, you would interpret these results as your, your risk averse in the loss domain and your risk seeking in the gain domain. But no, that's not what's going on at all. What's going on is this discriminability is changing. So, so decision field theory doesn't need to be assuming that you're changing your utility function depending upon if it's you know, loss domain or gain domain. We can use the same utilities for both and we can account for this crossover interaction effect <clears throat> by the um, standard deviation of the valence. We, we count for that crossover interaction by this standard deviation here, which changes the slope of those curves. Yeah, so, you know, this choice probability and decision field theory is primarily driven by this, this discriminability parameter. And this discriminability parameters, as I've said, is being scaled by this standard deviation. So, <clears throat> you know, like, um, What's going to happen is uh, when the standard deviation high, this, this negative utility is going to be, you know, have low impact when the standard deviation is high, you know, and so you're going to be closer to 0.5 here. Over here, um, you're going to be, you're going to be standard deviation is low, so you're going to be have a higher probability of choosing the sure thing right here. But over here, you're going to reverse because now you're going to have a high probability of choosing the sure thing when the standard deviation is low. This will be close to 0.5. So this, like, this is close to 0.5 and this is close to 0.5. But this goes, 
down to point one and this goes up to point nine. And so we get this reversal just because of the standard deviation. Now this kind of result where we, we find that the, um, the variance of the gamble changes the um, choice probabilities with this crossover interaction. It's been, it's been also been corroborated by other people in, like in economics, Pavlo Lavatsky and John Hay and Nat Wilcox and the psychologist Edo Ref. So this is a pretty well established finding now. But you know, we actually discovered it first with decision field theory. And we also get time pressure effects, like I said. And when we fit the model, <clears throat> the, solid, the solid lines are the model fit. So you can see the model's fitting very, very well to the choice probabilities. It's a little bit off right here, a little bit of trouble right there. But generally, it's a pretty good fit, like the while well, the R score is 0 0.99. <clears throat> but then we could take those same parameters and predict the mean decision times. And so here are the um, observed mean decision times. And here are predicted mean decision times predicted from, you know, this is our cross validation test. We use the parameters from the uh, fit by the choice probability, then, then use those same parameters to predict the mean decision times. And um, the red line is like the, you know, the um, low time pressure condition. The blue line is the high time pressure condition. So you can see we're getting the time pressure condition. We're also getting a speed up, you know, you're slower in the, um, in when, the when you're faced with the negative, loss versus you're faster when you're faced with a positive gain. We also pick up that effect. <clears throat> Let's skip over this application. Well, anyway, we, we replicated these results in various experiments. Maybe now we'll um, stop here and, and say this and I'll come back to you and show you another application to multi-alternative, multi-attribute decision-making like consumer choice, like you know, buying a car, or choosing an apartment or deciding a restaurant, things like that. So, so we'll see in a few minutes as, as I um, finish this recording. <clears throat>